in 2011, when journalist Tanya Talego went to Thunder Bay, she thought she was about to write about Indigenous voting patterns. Well, she was wrong. That story would never end up being filed. Instead, in its place, Talega uncovered a story that should have been screaming from headlines across the country. It should have been, but it wasn't. Seven high school students had gone missing and were found dead, and no one could explain why. In Seven Fallen Feathers, Talega shines a light on these young men and women honoring who they were, how they lived, and the people who loved them dearly. Tanya Talega is with us in studio. I'm so looking forward to speaking with you about this book. Thank you very much for having me. First of all, let's talk about how this book came about. We set it up a little bit. You went to file one story, you had a conversation with someone, and then everything changed. It's true. I still haven't filed that story on the 2011 federal election, <laughs> and that's what I went up to Thunder Bay to do. I was a reporter at Queen's Park, and I wanted to write about the federal election, so I pitched to my editors a story on why it is that Indigenous uh, people were not voting. I knew the answers to why that was, but my editors thought at the time in 2011 that this was, you know, wow, that's a really great idea. It sounds pretty uh, exotic and different, so why don't you go up and do it? So I did, and I went to Thunder Bay because I'm quite familiar with the city, and my mom grew up outside of Thunder Bay. And so I went to go see Stan Berdy, who was the Grand Chief at the time of Anishinaabe Aski Nation which is an area roughly the size of France outside of Thunder wow. Bay. Yeah, really huge territory, um, Treaty 9 territory, and it covers uh, 49 Northern First Nations, uh, 45,000 people live there, but their head office is in Thunder Bay. Mm. So I went to go talk to Stan and ask Stan about you know, voting patterns, and during that conversation, Stan kept looking at me and asking me, why aren't you writing a story about Jordan? And Jordan was, at the time, a 15-year-old student from Webaquay First Nation who was missing in Thunder Bay. Uh, Jordan was the seventh student to go missing, and seven is a very significant number in Indigenous culture. Can you explain that to mm -hmm. us? Seven is um, it's a really powerful number to everybody in Anishinaabe culture. Uh, there's uh, seven teachings of the grandfathers, uh, respect, humility, love, truth. There's um, These are the reasons why we conduct our lives in a certain way. And those teachings are really important to, to everyone. And there's also the uh, Seven Fires prophecy of, um, of the beginning of our time on Turtle Island or North America and sort of the, the evolution through those periods, those prophecies. So when he said seven, I was really quite amazed by that. And at the time, he, Jordan was missing um, and I was taken by Stan to the place where they believed that he was last seen, and it was by the river, the Kamenistiqua River, at the base of Mount McKay. And when we got there, I was really surprised because I looked up and I saw Mount McKay, and that's my grandmother's First Nation, mm. Fort William First Nation. And I sort of felt sick in, in my stomach, and I said, well, you know, why are we here? And he goes, this is why. This is where we thought that, um, that Jordan was last seen. And within a month, that is where his body would be found, actually right there in the water. Seven high school students, all gone missing. Mm -hmm. um, no, no headline story, nobody looking at trends, nobody looking at solutions. These are kids that had to leave home to head into Thunder Bay for school. Why did they have to leave home to go to school? Thanks for asking that question. That's something that still, to this day, I really can't believe. And I think a lot of Canadians, the more that I talk to them about this book, they really can't believe it either. There are no high schools for um, these kids in the northern communities. Even though it's, as, it's a landmass the size of France and 45,000 right. people That's live. right. That's right. I mean, there are some places that do have high schools, but they're very, very few and far between. So what happens is that when you turn 13, 14, or 15, if you want to go to grade 9 or 10, um, you have to leave your community, you have to leave your home, your culture, your family, everything that you know. And you should also keep in mind that the kids are leaving communities that are quite small, about 350 people to 1,000, 1,200 people. Sometimes there's, um, the communities don't have fresh water. There are no traffic lights in these communities because they're so small, no shopping malls. There's really nothing like that. And so when they leave to go to high school, they go to Thunder Bay, and it's an absolute culture shock to them. We do stories, and we see it for a few days, on when kids come here from international schools and they go missing. They're found dead. But the, even the families in some of these cases weren't properly contacted by officials when their That's kids right. went missing. What does that tell us? That says a lot, really, doesn't it? Um, and it says a lot, too, about so many things. 
for a long time, what would happen is that people would call the police, indigenous families would phone the police and say, my, my child is missing. If you look at specifically to the very first child to go missing, Jethro Anderson in 2000, he had just turned 15. And when his aunt, Dora Morris, called the police, um, this is what she was told. The person who answered the phone told her, oh, don't worry about it. He's probably just out there partying like all the other native kids. Then the phone hung up. It took six days for the police in Thunder Bay to respond to his, him being missing, a 15-year-old boy. He had actually just turned 15, too, earlier that month. And so it, it, it was quite shocking. And this was a theme that was heard over and over and over again. And I have to say, too, that it's not just heard with, with the seven students. It's also heard across the country mm -hmm. with murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls and with other situations. I want to pull out from the book for just a second and take a look across the country because I feel in reading this book that it could apply to many cities in many provinces. Right. That, those, that underlying, not even quiet racism, you know, spoken and accepted racism. Why are we, it's okay to be upset about residential schools, but not okay to be, to be angry at our present history? There's a direct line, too, from the residential schools and the experience that Indigenous people have had to what is happening now today in the Thunder Bay and actually what's happening across Canada. I mean, the country knew what was happening. You know, I'm, I'm amazed, too, that people say to me, oh, I didn't know, um, especially when um, older Canadians will come up to me and say, I had no idea that this was happening. And I'm always like, really? There were 150,000 Indigenous people put into these schools away from their language and their culture and everything they knew over the time from 1850 to 1996. I mean, I think that what was happening a lot of the time was that people were just looking away. Canadians for so long had been looking away. And that damage that was done, that intergenerational trauma, you know, you hear about it all the time, but it actually, it is real and it is true. And it, it has led to kind of um, a violence of indifference to a way. Mm. I've never heard it phrased that far. A bit phrase that way before. Tanya, thanks for coming in to talk about the book. Miigwech. It is, uh, it is a powerful book called Seven Fallen Feathers.